Brown is captured. He's tried. The trial is something of a sham. Uh, Brown is uh, suffering from wounds that he received during the battle. Uh, he asks for a delay of a couple of days so his lawyer from Ohio can arrive, and the judge refuses to delay the trial. Weakened by his wounds, Brown appeared in court every day on a cot. Knowing the conclusion was foregone, he listened but said little. John Brown was sentenced to death by hanging. In the month between the time he's convicted and the time he's hanged, Brown writes hundreds of letters across the country and essentially creates himself into an almost Christ-like martyr for northern opponents of slavery. I've been whipped, but I am sure I can recover all the lost capital occasioned by that disaster by only hanging a few moments by the neck. And I feel quite determined to make the utmost possible out of a defeat. John Brown was hanged on December 2nd, 1859. Across the North, meetings, prayer vigils, and church services were held to observe his death. These public displays of mourning outraged the South. The North has sanctioned and applauded theft, murder, treason. The South believes its own propaganda about John Brown. Southerners say all Northerners are like John Brown. In other words, they create John Brown to be, in their mind, the personification of the North. He's not. He's about as far out on the fringe as you could possibly get. But Southerners believe in their own minds that Brown is really the North. They refer to the John Brown Republicans. Threatened Southerners joined military companies, and Southern states appropriated funds to purchase arms. Yankees were tarred and feathered or run out of town on a rail. A few were lynched. The support for secession reached a critical mass. On his way to the gallows, John Brown handed a final note to his jailer. I, John Brown, am now quite certain that the crimes of this guilty land will never be purged away, but with blood. In the tense and fateful spring of 1860, the presidential election got underway. Just four months after the execution of John Brown, the Democratic Convention met in the overheated political atmosphere of Charleston, South Carolina. By 1860, finally, what in fact had occurred gradually over the 1850s came to a head. It became clear that the Democratic Party was no longer a national party, that there were Northern Democrats and that there were Southern Democrats, and Stephen Douglas's candidacy for the Democratic nomination finally brought it to head. Douglas's platform advocating popular sovereignty to settle the question of slavery in the territories infuriated Southerners. When it was passed, most of the delegates from Alabama and seven other southern states walked out of the convention. The Democratic Party had split in two. After months of wrangling, the Northern Democrats would give Stephen Douglas the nomination, and the Southern Democrats would nominate their own candidate, John C. Breckinridge. In May, the Republican convention took place in Chicago, Illinois, Abraham Lincoln's home state. The Republican Party in 1860 is running a candidate for president only for the second time in American history. In the previous election in 1856, they failed to carry five key northern states. And uh, they knew that if they could carry those states, they could win. Uh, and they needed, in order to carry those states, somebody who was a moderate. An anti-slavery man, per se, cannot be elected. But... A tariff, river and harbor, Pacific Railroad, free homestead man may succeed, although he is anti-slavery. Five candidates competed for the nomination at the Republican convention. On the first ballot, William Seward led by a strong margin. Lincoln ran second. On the second ballot, Lincoln drew to within several votes of Seward. 
On the third ballot, Lincoln took the lead, coming within one and a half votes of the number needed to win the nomination. In the breathless silence, the chairman from Ohio stood on a chair and announced the change of four more votes to Lincoln. There was a rush of great wind in the van of a storm. And in another breath, the storm was there. Thousands cheering with the energy of insanity. The increasing likelihood that Lincoln would be elected provoked a kind of hysteria in the South. The Republican Party represented an unacceptable threat to slavery and the Southern way of life. In the North, Lincoln and the Republican Party represented the only hope of resisting Southern domination. I will vote the Republican ticket next Tuesday. The only alternative is everlasting submission to the South. I want to be able to remember that I voted right at this grave crisis. The North must assert its rights now and take the consequences. The election results reflected the almost complete separation of North and South. Lincoln swept the North, receiving not a single electoral vote in the South. Breckinridge won all of the states of the Deep South. John Bell of the Constitutional Union Party took the border states of Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And Stephen Douglas, Lincoln's longtime rival, won only Missouri and half of New Jersey. But the electoral votes masked the more complex results of the popular vote. Bear in mind, in the final results, Lincoln only carried 39% of, of those who voted. He was very, very much one of, one of the most minority presidents we've ever had. Lincoln's election triggered an immediate reaction in the South. States began to arm themselves. Thousands joined Southern home guards and state militias. On December 13th, a caucus of Southern states met and issued a proclamation. The argument is exhausted. All hope of relief in the Union through the agencies of committees, congressional legislation, or constitutional amendments is extinguished. Seven days later, the first state seceded. We, the people of the state of South Carolina, do declare and ordain that the Union now subsisting between South Carolina and other states under the name of the United States of America is hereby dissolved. Over the next two months, South Carolina was followed by Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. But not all the citizens living in the South supported secession. And so the Rubicon was crossed and the state of Georgia was launched upon a dark, uncertain, and dangerous sea. The secessionists were jubilant. I never felt so sad before. When Sam Houston, the governor of Texas, refused to take an oath of loyalty to the Confederacy, he was evicted from the governor's office. The die has been cast by your secession leaders, and you must ere long reap the fearful harvest of conspiracy and revolution. On February 8, 1861, in Montgomery, Alabama, delegates from the seceded states founded a new nation. It was called the Confederate States of America. Its elected president was Jefferson Davis. The time for compromise has now passed. The South is determined to maintain her position and make all who oppose her smell Southern powder and feel Southern steel. The vice president of the Confederacy was Alexander Stevens. Our new government rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man. This government is the first in the history of the world based on this great physical and moral truth. Thank God we have a country at last to live for, to pray for, and if need be, to die for. Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis left their respective homes on the same day, Davis departing for Montgomery and Lincoln for Washington, D.C. For Lincoln, the departure was bittersweet. More than half his life had been spent in the town of Springfield, Illinois. He did not know when or if he would see it again. Threatened with assassination, Lincoln slipped into Washington under the cloak of night. 
On March 4, 1861, he was inaugurated as the 16th President of the United States. I hold that in contemplation of universal law and of the Constitution, the union of these states is perpetual. I therefore consider that the union is unbroken. Lincoln never recognized that secession had actually occurred. He always maintained that he was the president of Alabama and Georgia and Mississippi. His inaugural address was intended as much for Southern as for Northern ears. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of union when again touched, as surely they will be by the better angels of their nature. Old Abe Lincoln was inaugurated today. His speech was just what was expected from him. Stupid, ambiguous, vulgar, and insolent. And is everywhere considered a virtual declaration of war. By 1861, all efforts at compromise had failed. It seemed as though the unthinkable had now become unavoidable. I don't think that the Civil War we know, the war from 1861 to 1865 that killed 620,000 soldiers, was inevitable. But in 1858, Senator William H. Seward of New York, a leading Republican, had given a famous speech in which he said there was an irrepressible conflict between a free labor society in the North and a slave labor society in the South. And I do think that's right, uh, that some kind of uh, conflict between these two societies over the future of America was inevitable. The way I would put it uh, is at what point in the sectional conflict did the people themselves begin to think, begin to feel that a civil war was inevitable? Uh, and I think uh, 1858 is a good candidate uh, for that date. Lincoln's house divided speech was a, was a speech in the direction of the inevitability of the conflict. More and more people were thinking in terms of warfare, separation uh, in 1858, and it only grew in the next two years. And in this case, you had the Union versus the South. You had two diametrically opposed views, Lincoln believing, like Daniel Webster, that the Union is now and forever inseparable, one and for all, and the South arguing that secession was a right that they had. You had each side believing that it was absolutely morally correct, that it was absolutely legally correct, and when you had this, you had the stage for war. As nations cannot be rewarded or punished in the next world, they must be in this. By an inevitable chain of causes and effects, providence punishes national sins by national calamities. Mm -hmm. 